Hi, it's Dr. Mai. And I'm Malia Brown. I recently got surgery this past September of 2019. So it's been about two months and a lot of my swelling has gone down. I think that for the most part, it looks much better. For all this swelling to completely subside and to see the final results, you have to wait around six months. As the swelling is different for each person, it's difficult to ascertain how the final results would look like right after the surgery. So, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mine, can you tell me about my surgeries? In Malia's case, her nose shape is what we commonly call an arrow nose. In addition, her LR was wide, having some features of a bulbous nose. So the surgery slightly raised the height of her nose with the tip of the nose made thinner and more defined along with the LR being reduced. Let's check what type of nose Malaya wanted along with the process she went through piece by piece. We'll go through the implant, the arrow nose, the tip of the nose, and the LR in that order. In Malaya's case, the nose bridge between her eyes started low. So we recommended inserting implants. There are generally three types of implants for the nose bridge. Silicone, Gore-Tex, and Silitex. Silitex and Gore-Tex aren't as widely used these days compared to silicone, but each have their own pros and cons. I'll explain the positives and negatives of Gore-Tex and silicone implants. Compared to silicone, Gore-Tex doesn't protrude as visibly and also adheres well to the tissues. But tissues can infiltrate the pores of the Gore-Tex implants lowering the height of the nose later on. In addition, as Gore-Tex merges with the tissue, it becomes difficult to remove during a revision surgery. As a result, silicone usage is increasingly popular these days. Silicone implants may occasionally protrude more visibly, but has the benefit of being much more flexible and reducing the chances of foreign body rejection. Due to these reasons, Malaya decided to use silicone. She chose the height desired for her nose. We simulated how the nose would look like with actual implants and chose to raise the height by four millimeters. When I was in my consultation, I was a little weary of getting the implant because I didn't want my nose to be raised too high. But once I talked with the doctor, I realized that in order for my nose to look natural, I needed the implant. So after I realized that I needed the implant and now that I see my results, I'm very happy and glad that I went with the implant. So now let's see how my arrow nose changed. In my case for my surgery, I wanted my nose to be pointed a little bit more upward because it was pointed a little bit down before. When we did our consultation with Malia, she wanted to raise her droopy arrow nose. If the nose looks like an arrowhead, the surgical approach used is to raise the end of the nose to shorten it. Arrow nose surgery for longer noses and arrow-like noses are more difficult than other surgical nose cartilage correction. Right, which is why I carefully chose this hospital. It is recommended to receive arrow nose surgery among skilled doctors, so I wanted to make sure I went to somewhere that had doctors with a wealth of experience. As we can see on the screen, the nose is composed of bone, wing cartilage, and the septum. In arrow noses, the wing cartilages are separated and pushed up. Here, we create a support fixture near the septum to prop the nose. The septum, septum cartilage, and rib cartilage can be used to create the fixtures. When raising the height of the nose tip, cartilage from the nose and the ears are largely used. Nasal plastic surgery cartilage can lift up the nose tip, but as the cartilage is stiff, the nose tip may seem hard. Cartilage from the ear is less stiff, so the nose tip will come out more softer and more natural. Rib cartilage is occasionally used in a resurgery and has the benefit of creating a much sturdier support fixture. But many dislike the thought of having surgery in the rib area. Scars are left in the rib area and require a much longer recovery time. So as a result, donated cartilage is used in favor of rib cartilage. In Malia's case, we use the ear cartilage. Mime nose plastic surgery uses cartilage from the upper part of the ear 
and fold it in half to ensure it stays strong. In this way, it is strong enough to produce a raising structure on the nose, just like the cartilage already present in the nose. And I'm very glad that we use the ear cartilage because I can only imagine how painful it would be to get rib cartilage taken out. Even the ear was a little painful, so on your rib cage, I'm sure that it was very painful. But using the ear cartilage and it's folded right here on your nose, I think that it really helps with the implant to look very natural. So let's talk a little bit more about the tip of my nose. Before it was very blunt and wide. So can you tell me about how we decided to change it? First, we removed the tissue. Then we grouped the wing cartilage together to heighten the definition in the tip and turn it into a more refined shape. I think it's very apparent and you can see how cinched my nose is at the tip and I can also feel but not feel at the same time <laughs> because there's extra cartilage there so I can definitely see and feel that difference. One of the most important factors in ascertaining beauty is in the proportions. It's ideal when the alar is proportionate to the distance between the eyes. This distance is called the glabella. As Malia's alar was wider than her glabella, the surgery reduced her alar. There are usually two methods in reducing the alar. The first method is, very simple, alar cinching. This is especially effective for those who dislike their alar widening when they smile. But if the surface area of the alar is large to begin with, then alar cinching is ineffective in reducing the surface area of the alar. In this case, the second method is used. We incise around the alar to partially remove some of the surface and reduce the alar. The incision line follows the concave alar line, but is designed one millimeter above said line. If the incision line followed the alar line completely, it would cave in post-surgery. The scars are hidden behind the concave alar region, so it is difficult to see. If you secrete high amounts of sebum, it can intensify and increase scarring of the skin. So make sure to regularly take your sebum management medicine. Furthermore, a bulbous nose is different from a wide alar. An alar reduction doesn't always lead to a more attractive nose for those who have a bulbous nose. In Malia's case, she couldn't get the desired effect she wanted solely through alar reduction. So she did a surgery where she removed some tissue from the tip of her nose to make it more defined. Before my surgery, I was not quite sure about the process and how it goes because I had never gotten surgery before. But I think that after now, and you have concisely explained these to me, I feel a little bit better. Are there any other questions regarding surgery in general? Absolutely. I have a whole list of FAQ questions for you. So there are many that are around me that aren't really into doing surgery. They kind of feel scared by it. So a lot of them opt to do fillers instead. So can you tell me what you think about fillers? Yeah, sure. Fillers spread out easily, so it's difficult to maintain their shape. Also, they're absorbable and non-absorbable fillers. In the case of non-absorbable fillers, they can become entangled with the tissue, causing issues during revision surgery. Fillers have the risk of calcifying and can be very time consuming as you need to regularly maintain and refill. If you do decide to use fillers, it is highly recommended that you use the verified hyaluronic acid fillers. So are there any instances when an alar reduction is impossible? Yes, when the skin itself is too thick and when the nostril is too exposed, it is not possible. Mm. So is it possible when you raise the height of your nose that you can also get the benefits of epicanthoplasty? As the height of the nose is raised, the skin on top of the eyes slightly stretch upwards, making it look like an epicanthoplasty, but it is slightly different from the actual surgery. It also focuses on making the shape of the eyelids appealing. So there are many who are actually worried about getting a botched procedure, especially rhinoplasty. So can you tell me the type of things that can go wrong during it? Yes, one indicator are the contractures, and they occur when remaining inflammation is strongly pulled upwards during formation. These don't occur from the beginning, rather they are a product of poor maintenance when the swelling bleeds 
and water enters during facial cleansing. When contractures occur, the nose twists upwards and hardens so it poses a serious danger. Please contact the hospital immediately when the first inflammation occurs and we will provide inflammation medicine which will help it subside after proper care. Even when deciding on a hospital, make sure to choose a place that properly and responsibly answers patients' inquiries. So mm -hmm. how old do you have to be in order to get rhinoplasty? Mm -hmm. It's recommended that you turn at least 16 before you can do rhinoplasty, when physical development ends. For surgeries that don't involve an osteotomy, you can start during high school. Thank you for coming today, Malia. Thank you, I had a great time being here as well. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe, like, and share our video. Until, Until we meet again, beauty is mine. Bye-bye.